So sitting with me here today is uh, Steven Speer. You're a senior lecturer at uh, MIT uh, Sloan School of Management, founder of c to solve and author of two very interesting books. Thank you. you have the, the High Velocity Edge mm -hmm. and your most recent uh, book, Wiring the Winning Organization, appeared this year. I yes, think. that's right. Yeah, a few months ago. Yeah, perfect. Um, you've made numerous contributions to the fields of uh, how organizations can achieve and sustain mm -hmm. high performance. And this is a fantastic topic that, that we would like to, to dig into today. I'm um, super happy to have you here. Um, I would like to start with, with a small quote that you delivered um, during your keynote at the Manufacturing Day in Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, you said, innovation is discovered, not designed. And I thought that was a very interesting one. Right. What do you mean with this? Yeah, so I think there's a sort of a conventional notion, which is uh, unfortunately quite wrong, which is um, we think about the inventor of something technological or the innovator of some new approach to doing something new as uh, someone who's uh, deliberative, almost mm -hmm. the, uh, the rodent sculpture of the thinker, you know, sitting mm -hmm. there on a rock naked, yeah. uh, chin on, on a clenched fist. Um, but re really, um, whether it's invention or innovation, uh, it's uh, an iterative process of looking at something, realizing it's poorly understood, um, tinkering with the situation to see what can be learned, and then based on uh, that new understanding, saying, oh, um, I can see further to uh, a new horizon, and then doing some more um, probing around, figure out what's not understood, and then further tinkering. So um, whether it's um, invention, and, and, and there's ample evidence. You start looking at um, uh, the uh, citations from no Nobel laureates, and you give people credit, oh, the, the discovery of genetics. Then when you look into the history of genetics, you realize that, yes, Watson and Crick um, um, consolidated a deep understanding of genetics, but there was so much they were building off of. Plus, it was the woman in the laboratory they didn't give credit to. It was, that's, a, that's a separate issue. Yeah. But it, it wasn't like they in, went from zero to everything. They went from almost everything to almost everything plus delta to get to the solution. Yeah. Um, e e even Albert Einstein, um, similarly, and you know, he probably of anybody was most capable of having a gigantic delta as his own singular contribution. I was building on all sorts of things in, in advance. I was recently reading about um, um, Isaac Newton, and yeah, you know, standing uh, on the shoulders of giants. Standing on the shoulders of giants. It wasn't. You know, that, that's the thing. Like Isaac Newton, people think he, he's he's taking a nap somewhere, and an <laughs> apple falls on his head, and he says, "Aha! Gra mm. gra gravitation and F equal m a." Didn't happen that way. He was building on hundreds and hundreds of years of people um, trying to explain things. You know, in particular, the, the movement of celestial bodies, and then. Up to a point, they had these huge discoveries, and, and Newton, and again, he was singularly capable because of his genius, but he added that delta, which then consolidated things. The same thing is true, so that's around the invention side of things, but innovation also. It's not as if someone um, you know, looks and says, ah, I've got this, you know, we're all using smartphones now. No one invented the smartphone. Mm -hmm. You know, we give credit to you know Steve Jobs and whatnot, but he didn't. He just tried to design a desktop computer that was beautiful and easy and fun to use. And someone else was uh, inventing things of all sorts of uh, telemetry and, and, and communication at distance. And these things, convergent came together as one person solved the problem and added to that understanding, and, and, and incrementally things layered up. And then all of a sudden, there's that what appears to be the eureka moment. Now, why, why is that so important? Is that um, when we're uh, thinking about invention or innovation within enterprises, um, we have to respect the process, and the process is an iterative one, which eventually converges on an answer. Mm -hmm. But before it converges on an answer, it converges on a lot of things that don't work from which we have to learn. Yeah, innovation is a people's business, mm -hmm. in essence, right? Um, and you're right that that. The incremental innovation is probably 90% of, 95% of all the innovations that, that go to market, uh, but the radical innovation, right. the disruptive one, if we uh, talk in terms of, of Clay Christensen, for example, yep. those are the ones that catch the eye. That's right. Right. But even, even they have decades probably of research and, and trial and error before they get their eureka moment, so yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, well, you just, just pick up on that, you know, people say, oh, what we need is a breakthrough invention here, a breakthrough innovation. And um, 
that leads in the direction of creating time and space to put people in some kind of isolation, and perhaps in that isolation, give them even budget and say, all right, now come through with the breakthrough. And, but that's not how things happen. Um, it just isn't. And you, know, you mentioned Clay Christensen, and I appreciate that. I had a, really the blessing of having mentorship and friendship with him for a, about a 20-year period. And, and Clay's point is that disruptive innovation is not something that um, you said, oh, I'm going to do a disruptive innovation. All his examples, and his examples are great because he uh, had this great historical thread through his uh, research, mm -hmm. was that someone saw a problem and said, you know what, no one's paying attention to that particular problem, but I bet we can uh, kludge and cobble together a solution to that. And then someone sees that solution and says, oh, I have a problem over here, and um, it might be different than yours, but the solution you created there, I can add to or modify mm -hmm. I have a solution over here. And so there's this kind of layering, leapfrogging thing. And at the end, it looks like uh, the disruptive innovation or any other type is a breakthrough. But when you go back through the history and you try and look for the breakthrough, you can't find it. One more example, we mentioned this in the book. So in 1969 in July, so we're coming up to an anniversary now, um, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, Apollo 11. And uh, Neil Armstrong gave the very poetic mm -hmm. statement that was a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. And when you look at the history of the, uh, that program, it was poetic and a beautiful thing to say when the eagle has landed and now a small mm -hmm. step. But in fact, there was a lot of accuracy to what he said, not just poetry. Because um, when you look at all the things that had occurred um, from the very first uh, manned spaceflight by the Americans with Alan Shepard, all the way through Apollo 11, Every flight and then everything, all the activities between flights was adding thin, thin slivers of validation on new technological invention. And no one actually ever designed the mission to the moon and back safely by the end of the decade. It was this sliver, okay, that's validated. Next sliver, that's validated. Boom, 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 up to the point that he had um, and that crew had the last sliver, the yeah. small step, which cumulatively looks like the giant leap. There never was a giant leap. It was just the accumulated yeah. effect of all this discovery. Very, very small steps. Um, and there was a lot of trial and error there as well. Huge amount. Unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of people, some dozen, I think, astronauts mm -hmm. died in this right. process because it, space is hostile. Yes. I think it was 1972. There's now a small plaque on the moon mm -hmm. with a uh, commemoration of the astronauts who gave their lives to advance. Right, human. right. Uh, space flight um, and people just you see what is there in front of you and, and right. what is being said but everything that goes on uh, behind the scenes for example that's right gets, gets forgotten yep yeah um, but if, we, if we talk about um, looking for needs and problems uh, within organizations for example so it's about talking to the people who are actually doing things yep. not the people who are sitting in the in, in their office usually um, that's what you call the, the problem space. Mm -hmm. um, people talking to people. Could, could you dig a little bit into what, what problem space is? And Yeah, absolutely. So um, the two big influences or influencers on my thinking about innovation, one is Clay Christensen, Disruptive Innovation. The other guy more recently is a fellow named Steve Blank. Steve mm -hmm. is at uh, Stanford now. Yeah. Huge success as an innovator himself, and it's his ideas which then uh, propel this uh, notion of lean startup. Uh, he's sort of the intellectual genius behind it. You stay, started looking at Clay. Um, Clay's point about innovation it was that it was a social phenomenon, not a necessarily a technological one. And um, his examples of uh, hard drives for computers and later on um, inventions of uh, um, backhoes that dis display steam shovels, whatever example is, it was always that there was uh, an incumbent who had a business model. And what is a business model? A business model is a a social construct of the activities I'm going to do and how I'm going to measure them to provide something of value to you, which you're going to reward me for doing. Mm -hmm. And what's Clay's point is that innovation and disruptive innovation in particular was trying to find the people who um, they, their experiences, their needs were outside the existing business models and someone else started looking at their experiences tried to figure out if there was a solution to the um, difficulties they were experiencing and that a new business model um, could be created or discovered to uh, match activities to meet their needs. 
Steve Blank, similarly, when he talks about innovation, one of the things he encourages people is, uh, quote unquote, get out of the building. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because inside the building, what are you doing? You're subscribing to a pre-existing business model, which is a set of values, a set of norms, of routines, procedures, policy, et cetera, which have already been validated in terms of how we work inside the organization to generate value that we deliver to someone outside the organization. And his point is, well, you could keep doing that, and he calls that kind of behavior an execution organization, he says, but you can continue to execute, but you're not going to innovate if you continue to execute because, again, that's around your values, your norms, your procedures, your routines, your behaviors, your attitudes. He says, if you really want to innovate, you have to get, quote unquote, out of the building physically because that's you have to encounter, encounter other people you're not already talking exactly. to. But I think it's, it's more than just physical. It's the, 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 um, the figurative of get out of the building, get out of the mindset, get out of the uh, preconceived notions about how to behave to deliver value that will be appreciated. You have to get out of that to discover something new. Yeah. Yeah. How can we, how can organizations, corporates mainly, for mm -hmm. example, how can they implement this in their organization? There are dozens of theories on yep. orga organizing for innovation. Um, ambidexterity, Aurelian Tushman is, is one of them, for example, one of the most famous ones. How, what, what is your view on this? How can, yep. can companies implement this type of innovation or this type of culture? That's right. So, um, both Clay and Steve, this Clay Christensen and Steve Blank, both are, um, I think, respectful of people's ability to execute very, very well according to uh, one set of policies, procedures, routines, norms, values. Um, but they also recognize that if we're doing that, then it's very hard to execute against a different set and not only execute against a different set, but discover a different set. So Clay had this term, uh, the independent or the standalone organization, where people had committed time, committed resources to um, find problems and solve them where they didn't have to uh, subscribe to the, uh, the conventional way of doing things. And Steve Blank also, he has a similar idea, different semantics around it, but a similar idea of the execution organization, which is adhering to the, the values and the approaches that have already been validated and the innovation organization, which has the opportunity to explore for new values and new mm. procedures and that sort of thing. Exploration, exploitation. That's right. Um, and uh, the appendextrous term, I, I think I understand what they're getting at, but in some regards, it's, um, it might actually be misleading because you think about what uh, someone who's appendextrous can do. Mm -hmm. They can do the same thing with both hands. Like I, I can write with my right hand you know, reasonably well, I guess, um, I can't with my left hand. Certain things I can do sort of kind of with both, but the point about it being ambidextrous is that the, the hands are interchangeable for the task. The thing is, if you go back to what uh, Clay Christensen and Steve Blank are saying, is that the, uh, the executing against what you know to do and the, um, the invention or the innovation about something new is actually not the same task, it's a different task. Mm -hmm. And so um, you might actually want to go back and say, actually, that's not an ambidextrous organization, you know, one which is the hands do, uh, are interchangeable doing the same things. Actually, the hands are very specialized. That one hand, the left hand can do certain things and the right hand can do certain things and they're not interchangeable. They're, um, they complement each other and uh, they complete each other, but they're different. Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare, say, the high-performing organizations, because it's really mm -hmm. your, your field, of course, the high-performing organizations versus the not so high-performing, right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> how would uh, describe them? Um, you mentioned in your book three layers that are, that are important or that you can see in these kind yep. of organizations that really perform very well. Yeah. Um, you're talking about skill set, organizational execution, and so social circuitry. Right. Um, is this meant as a kind, also a kind of um, theory for mm -hmm. organizing for innovation? That's right. So um, I think there are couple of related ideas here. Mm -hmm. So in the book we talk about, um, we start off with the paradox, which is all else equal, there are some organizations which are way, way better at generating and delivering value to society than anybody else. So that's the paradox. And then we have a theory about that. How to explain the paradox, we say those who um, generate and deliver so much more value to society do so because they create conditions internal to themselves where it's easier to solve problems. So we, then we really focus that it's about organizing 
around the capabilities of people's individual minds and, and, and collective minds to, mm -hmm. to collaborate towards solving hard problems. And when we say that, when we start having to think about, are we designing our organizations to um, create great conditions for problem solving, particularly collaborative problem solving, we say we have to really start thinking about the, desi the design, um, managing design. So we talk about layer one, which is um, the problems there we're dealing with, you know, quote unquote, literally, figuratively, the object on the bench top in front of us, be it a, a, a gear, um, which has material properties and geometric properties or a gene which has its uh, genetic properties or whatever. There's an object there and that's one layer of expertise. And then there's another um, element of expertise we call layer two which is the instrumentation that if I have a gear on a bench top and there's a tremendous amount of expertise about the gear itself, someone else has to have expertise about the, um, the machine tools by which the gear is given shape. Mm -hmm. There's a third layer though um, and we say that's another engineering problem which is if to uh, engineer the gear is a collaborative problem, or is a problem that has to be solved through collaborative problem solving, and the, uh, the design and the use of the instrumentation is also a problem that gets resolved through collaborative problem solving, then there's the, uh, the processes and the procedures that allow that collaboration to occur. Mm -hmm. And we all know that if we're in an organization where processes and procedures allow us to talk to the right other people at the right time in the right way about the right things, problem solving is much easier to do. On the other hand, if the policies and procedures are such that it's hard to talk to the right person in the right way at the right time, um, problem solving is very hard to accomplish. Yeah. And so we, we spend in the book a lot of attention on what we call this third layer, this overlay of quote unquote social circuitry, which um, its uh, component elements is uh, the, uh, the policies and procedures. Yeah. How can we measure this, the social circuitry? How can we one maybe month, who can and who should talk to whom is right. already talking, and and can we measure this somehow? Yeah. So in terms of the uh, the, the mapping and the measurement, the, the answer around the mapping is yes, it can be done. Um, in reference to uh, one of my uh, colleagues and, and, and professors, this guy Steve Eppinger, um, he created something called the Design Structure Matrix. This goes back to the 80s or 90s, and it was a, a graphical way of representing a system and of all the elements in the system, which were connected to which. And the point he was trying to make is that, um, depending on how the things mapped, it had more modularity and more nesting to it than uh, otherwise. And um, the point was that we want to be really sensitive to the amount of uh, nesting and modularity within a mm -hmm. system, because the more nesting and the more modularity, the easier it is to solve problems locally and have the solutions come together into a well-integrated whole, the more, um, non-nesting, the more sort of, uh, sort of sprawling, integrated architecture to a system, the much harder it is to solve problems because everything is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. So that, that's Steve Eppinger's design structure matrix. Um, you mentioned, I appreciated that um, we founded a, a firm that does business process software. A big part of what the pro the, that software does, it has a flow function, which is to help capture who does what work, dependent on whom, and, and who's dependent on that person. And the idea there is to um, also capture the architecture of the circuitry. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that part. Now, as far as the measuring, um, I, I don't yet have a way of, um, you know, like a regular circuit, you can measure a circuit by uh, voltage, current, resistance, etc. cetera. Um, I'm at the point, I, I welcome any kind of input and collaboration <laughs> on this, how you could quantify this, but qualitatively, you can, um, it, you get into the questions when you ask people, well, what did you do today? And very often what you'll find in a lot of organizations is that people will give you an answer, even if they're in an, an organization which is supposed to be generative of new ideas, they'll give you answers which sound like production, which is, oh, um, today I wrote this number of lines of code. Oh, today I ran this number of tests. Oh, today I fabricated this number of things to put, put into those tests. And, and it sounds almost like they're talking about the end of an assembly line and what's mm -hmm. getting shipped, when in fact, those questions, when we put them to people inside research organizations, no one cares what they created physically that day. What they really cared is what problems they solved that day. Now, it's interesting, right? So that's an organization which stood up to generate ideas, and when you ask people what they did every day, they gave you very physical answers. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, a big part of uh, what shapes my thinking on this topic is uh, experiences at Toyota. And those folks, clearly they're running assembly plants, which um, they're supposed to be producing a vehicle every 50 seconds or so. 
And um, yet when you go into those facilities and ask people, oh, you know, how was today? You know, what did you accomplish today? The answers are rarely, oh, here's the number of vehicles we created of what type. Um, the answers are, oh, here are the problems we had today, and here's the problem solving we're doing between today and tomorrow so the problem doesn't happen again, or here's the problem we had yesterday, the week before, the month before, and here's the description of the rigorous problem solving we did, and what we discovered about that interaction of people and product and process in place to make the problem go away. So it's ironic, right? In a yeah. place which is supposed to generate ideas, they tell you what they produced. In a place that exists to produce things, they tell you about the ideas they generated. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It's, it's, it's an organizational mindset, mm -hmm. perhaps. Maybe also cultural in mm -hmm. Japan. I'm not quite sure. But um, organizational mindset that m many companies, perhaps in Europe, don't have. Like you say, it's about, we did this, we did this, and this, my tasks are done. And in the end, someone picks that up and then something else gets done. Right. But this is not how you improve. No. Right. Um, if you think about manufacturing companies, many of which in Europe, also in the US, I suppose, can be quite um, conservative. Mm -hmm. Also in the R&D efforts, um, especially in Europe, uh, automotive industry, for example, you have a very long standing tradition. Um, of highly technological products and innovations, but for a very long time in very closed, centralized R&D centers, we're doing what we're doing, yep. the not invented here syndrome and these kind of things. Um, how can they improve, first of all, internally their, um, their communication, mm -hmm. their social circuitry, and how can they open up to external companies, say mm. startups, new technologies, more yeah. towards open innovation? That's a great question. Um, I'll go back to uh, you know, Clay Christensen and Steve Blank with the, uh, the standalone or the innovation organization. The, the, the component of the larger whole which is allowed to have committed time, space, resources to explore new problems and um, try and generate new answers to those problems. So um, again, you know, the, the standout in the um, the large volume automobile industry is Toyota. And what's really quite remarkable is how um, creative they've been and disciplined they've been about creating separate organizations to invent something new. And I'll just give you a couple of highlights on this. So you start thinking about some of Toyota's um, really stellar successes. So one was the introduction of Lexus. Toyota had um, no luxury brand, no luxury presence. Um, they were well known and rightly so for uh, their ability to provide very affordable, very reliable uh, mid-market cars. Um, but then, no, and, and so, again, you know, to this discovery versus deliberation, they tried and they failed um, to deliberate their way to the answer on luxury. They took Toyotas and put a lot of bling and chrome and leather on them, it didn't work so good. So what they did is they said, you know what, we need an independent organization. So they took a small group of engineers, and have them go live in Beverly Hills for like six months. Mm -hmm. Say, guys, go figure out what luxury actually means to the, uh, the, the American consumer. And, and that was it. And they weren't responsible for uh, upgrading on a Camry or an Avalon or anything like that. They were just, go discover luxury. And it turned out the answer that came back was that um, luxury wasn't just um, the physicality of the product, like let's say a, mm -hmm. you know, a BMW or a Mercedes. It was the whole experience of buying and servicing the thing. And when they came back, they said, oh, we've got a business model for the Lexus. And they said, oh, what's that? What is it? How does it compare to BMW and Mercedes? I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the, 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 the analogy for us is the Four Seasons. And they said, what? Yeah, the Four Seasons. It's like, they treat you so nice at the Four Seasons. That's why people pay, are willing to pay um, so much more for a room at a Four Seasons mm -hmm. than some other hotel. And Lexus, if you look at the experience there, it's, um, it's a fine car. Um, but it's the experience. It's the Four Seasons experience. Mm -hmm. Another example with that is um, hybrid, where Toyota just is crushing the industry in terms of its ability to put hybrid reliably across, I think it's three dozen different platforms now. That team also, um, Toyota could have tried to invent hybrid inside the organization that was already doing Camry and other cars and trucks like that. But more likely than that, you know, this is the sustaining organization. They would have produced things which looked very much like Camry. And so they took a team of engineers and said, you know, go over here, committed time, committed space, independent of the larger organization, and, and tell us what you figure out and what you discover. And there was some technological discovery about uh, batteries and motors. There was some 
to your point about open innovation, there was a lot of discovery on partnerships mm -hmm. because um, motors, electric motors on that scale were never used inside an automobile before. And so um, these engineers had to go way outside the auto industry to find that expertise. Same thing with the batteries and the, uh, the sophisticated software to manage uh, power flows um, within the car. That was not something that had been done in the auto industry. So they were allowed, because they were independent, to explore widely. So you know, tying it back to your point about um, open innovation, I think the starting point is acknowledging that we have a need to innovate and so what we're going to do is put people over here and give them the latitude to innovate. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, then that opens up the, uh, the license for them to look anywhere they need to for uh, opportunities on ideas, partnership, resourcing, et cetera. If we keep them inside, they're kind of locked in with what we already do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, the ecosystem, we often talk on this podcast about ecosystems and also within the organization, we're also an ecosystem organization that um, the, the synergies of one plus one is three, for example, yep. uh, are very real. Mm -hmm. But for some organizations, especially SMEs, for example, who don't have the budget and probably the financial leeway to, to do all of these uh, things like technology scouting and, mm -hmm. and look for startups, new technologies, do not only cross company border, but cross sector mm -hmm. innovation. It's incredibly difficult to try and get this mind, mindset they know they have to but they can't right how how can they with limited financial resources and and just churning out usually what they do to survive um, how can they thrive yeah so um i think the trap we want to avoid is comparing our situation to that particularly of the uh the already well-established, wildly successful enterprise. Because when we look at them and they spend, you know, they, they can make discretionary marginal decisions in the, in the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, where the, the, the smaller, medium-sized company, they can make decisions maybe in the, uh, the thousands or tens of thousands of euros or dollars, whatever it happens to be. And so that comparison, they look like they fail. The, the comparison, the more, more reasonable comparison is, is uh, what am I doing versus what can I be doing? Mm -hmm. And um, if we're talking about you know, personal growth or growth of a, a small group of people working together, and you say, well, um, each day, are you uh, totally using your time available, committed to doing what you already know how to do for the reasons you already understand? Mm -hmm. Or are you using even most of your time for that, but some of your time is committed to trying to come up with new ways to do um, what you're already doing, or just asking the question, the very good question, which is, are we even doing the right thing for mm -hmm. the right reasons, and um, then coming up with different ways of doing that. And, and again, it, it's not that you're going from a zero to uh, tens or hundreds or millions of euros, but are you going from zero to a few? Then maybe the next time you have a few plus a few, mm -hmm. right? And it's, you know what it is? It's sort of the uh, back to the uh, um, small step, giant leap yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, Wherever you are, if you have committed time to take small steps each day, then you have the possibility of advancing. Maybe it's not as fast as you would like, but at least you're going to advance. On the other hand, if you're just waiting around for that magic moment where you have the opportunity to take the giant leap, it'll never come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is really applying this kind of uh, incremental innovation approach, not only to your production or to your, to your technology, but also to your organization, mm -hmm. to the people, and if you talk about personal growth as well, also to yourself. Right. That's a very interesting, interesting point. Yeah. Um, maybe one last, one last thing. Sure. Um, when we were at the manufacturing day, we were also in, in a panel um, discussion, and one of the other panelists said, um, should we de-risk innovation? We're especially talking about a European context here, mm -hmm. there are some cultural differences that, that come in play. Should we de-risk innovation there are a lot of companies that want to work together with startups, for example, who have a different kind of uh, speed, mm -hmm. right? They're much faster, um, less bureaucratic. Big organizations are quite bureaucratic, of course. They have their structures, they have processes. Right. Um, they might have technologies that they have to keep quiet. Um, is that something that's necessary? And if yes, how 
Hmm. Can we de-risk the innovation, open collaborative innovation process? Yeah, so first out of respect to big organizations, which people say they're needlessly bureaucratic, um, just to be careful on the term needless, mm -hmm. um, there's reason to be bureaucratic. Then there's some parts of it which are needless, but the whole thing isn't needless, and there's a reason for that. It, it goes back to uh, you know Blank and Christians and all this stuff about innovation. No one, well, there are people, but by and large, most people aren't innovating because they want to constantly generate new ideas which don't get traction. Most people want to innovate to come up with a new idea that gets tremendous amount of traction. And um, you know, people talk about the serial innovator. Uh, you know, normally, a serial innovator is the person who had an idea and it didn't get traction, so they had to get the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But the people, once they get to the fifth or the sixth and it's successful, um, more often than not, they stop innovating and they start executing. And why is that? Because there's huge rewards for execution. Mm -hmm. um, innovation is just, you know, in sort of financial terms, it, it's building you the option to execute someday if you've actually uh, created the opportunity. An investment in the potential. It, that's yeah. right. It's an investment in the potential. So why do you have um, the bureaucratization of organizations? Is because now you want to execute and you want to be, ex be able to execute efficiently, effectively, reliably, and so you build procedure around that, and that's where the bureaucracy comes. Yeah. So um, I think we should be respectful of that, of right? Because without it, it, the, the extreme, without any bureaucracy at all, is just, we just have to make it up as you go, yeah. and that's not a way towards efficiency and effectiveness. And every startup that, that starts to grow will, will notice that from a certain point onwards, they need processes. That's right, they they need need, because that's where you get the repeatability. Mm -hmm. So then you get this issue of um, the de-risking, and a big part of the de-risking is this insulation, which is creating the organization which has opportunity to um, it's not beholden to the bureaucracy, which makes sense because it's trying to do new things. So why have the things which allow repeatability on this when they're trying to do something new? But the other thing is not only are they um, protected from the bureaucracy, the execution organization, that execution organization is protected from them. Mm -hmm. That they have committed time and space to uh, find new problems and test new ideas and go through that iterative uh, discovery exploration process with the promise that they're not going to be injecting into the execution organization new ways that haven't yet been validated against the legacy business model. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually a big part of the protection. I, I think what ends up happening, why people become so uh, risk averse, is uh, absent the partitioning of, and this is a term we use in the, in the new book, that a um, big part of incrementalism, what is that, is to recognize what's known and partition it from what's unknown, and this becomes a small step, right? Which is, it's in the unknown space that you try new things mm -hmm. without um, being cautious not to disrupt the basis, the foundation, which is already known and validated. Um, I think part of the risk, the way to um, manage risk is not to not accept it, but to compartmentalize it, and by mm -hmm. compartmentalizing it, we protect the experiment from the, um, the machine, and we protect the machine from the experiment. Yep. It's also about accepting and embracing the mm -hmm. risk, realizing that risk is there, and it's unavoidable, and working with it. That's you know? right. Yeah. And there's another point to what you said, you said it was ex excellent uh, bringing up, is um, when we sort of compartmentalize the risk, recognize that um, the output of the risk we're taking is not new production, but it's new insight. Mm -hmm. and um, when we start realizing that the reason we're doing this thing, which has an uh, uncertain outcome, it's not because we're trying to generate something which has, uh, let's say, financial value. What we're trying to do is generate insight. And if we realize that the reason we're doing this is to generate insight, then actually that's never risky, right? Because we're always learning from it. Even if it doesn't gen generate insight, so long as we're then rigorous in asking the, uh, the, 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 the right questions, questions. Yeah. and getting the feedback, which then can become feed forward, then that was no risk at all. In fact, that was insurance. Because if we hadn't um, done that experiment and we hadn't learned from the experiment, then um, we would have been left with ignorance rather than a, a new understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the ultimate risk, right? Which is yeah. being ignorant. Yeah, no, it's true. It's absolutely true. I think on that note, this is a very nice, uh, nice quote to, to end here. Um, Steven Spirit, thank you so much for letting us pick your brain. And oh, absolutely. Here on uh, The Art of Making. Um, enjoy your time in Vienna. I will. And uh, safe travels back to the U.S. Thank yeah, you thank so you. And, and let me just say thank you for this also. Um, you know, look, it's, it's always great to uh, 
share what one has already learned, but is, uh, you know, the viewers of this will realize mm -hmm. some of your questions led to answers like, oh, it's quick, I got that. And others, uh, I was rambling, thinking out loud. And I appreciate this because what you did is, apropos what we're talking about, you created a uh, low risk environment to sort of just kick around the ideas and they don't come out so well formed. <laughs> And that's okay, I think, of course. because the next, the third and the fourth and the fifth and maybe the 20th iteration, um, if they're valuable, um, and maybe they're not, but if they're valuable, they'll consolidate down to the one or two sentence answer. So thanks for this venue for Our trying pleasure. to think it. win-win situation. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you're hearing, make sure to subscribe to The Art of Making on the podcast platform of your choice. We're also more than happy to hear from you, so reach out through the EIT Manufacturing website, that is eitmanufacturing.eu, or find us on the usual social media channels. Take care and talk soon.